Hi, I'm Mark Goldstein. Uh, I am presently, um, uh, I think it's assistant clinical professor uh, at the Thornton School of Music at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles, California, which in fact is where we are now. Uh, we're in Dahini Library uh, at USC, one of the few old buildings that has a proper ambiance, um, and it was actually um, built with money from the oil business. Yeah, a lot of money from the oil business. Who knows what blood lies behind that? Um, as I said, I'm teaching at the uh, Thornton School of Music. I also teach a class at the law school here in entertainment law. Uh, I spent uh, 25 years as a lawyer in the music business, representing uh, private parties from artists to publishing companies to record companies to management companies uh, and uh, for about five, six years and then went in-house at CBS Records and then went from there to Warner Brothers Records and ran business affairs there for about 15 years and left after being there about 20, a little less than 20 years because I'd always planned to change careers when I was 50 and I got a head start on that by starting to teach here before that. Um, had been teaching here full time for like four and a half years, almost five years when I left Warner Brothers and uh, have been focusing mostly on this, uh, the teaching, for the last two years, but still do a lot of consulting um, for artists, for record companies, for video game companies, for internet companies, um, for some other attorneys. Uh, always fascinated to represent an attorney. Um, and uh, I play music still, played music when I was in college. Um, enjoy playing music, have time to do it now, have time to enjoy music, and um, I even uh, write a little bit. I know it's going to sound like you know, a cliche, but even write a musical here and there. Those of you who want to talk about the rights can feel free to contact me. Just get to the website here, they'll get you in the right direction. So that's, that's the not basics, but, you know, and you learn something about tahini too, so that's good. Um, that's a good question. Um, and I actually wondered about that sometimes, I, because it would come up when I'd be interviewing people for, for positions to, in, in the Business Affairs Department. Um, because, as, as you probably know, a surprising number of people um, end up um, deciding that they want to do music a lot because they were musicians, or because they wanted to be musicians, or because they had been unsuccessful musically. And um, I think the bigger question, which is that does it help most people who have that background, um, as far as I can tell, it doesn't make that much difference. Um, I think it can make a difference if you're already a good lawyer, if your skill set's a solid skill set. Um, I think then the background of having been on the creative side, having put up with the, the problems that any musician faces, having to deal with other musicians with the essentially um, arbitrary nature of music and, and the, 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 the sort of not necessarily quantifiable aspects, that can be very useful. But it's not going to get you past the baseline. If you don't have the, the, the solid skill set, legal skill set, the analytic skills, the, the, the reasoning skills, the, the interpersonal skills to be able to get to the heart of what's, what's the problem in a, in a negotiation, what do the parties really want, and how can you fashion a compromise that will get you there. If you don't have that stuff, um, I think in most cases the, the being, having been a musician isn't going to help you. But if you've got that basic skill set, you're already a good lawyer, and you want to be a great lawyer or an even better lawyer in the music business, yeah, I think having been a musician can be helpful. On the other hand, I've seen, I've seen situations, not very many, but I've seen situations where, I can't mention names, I don't think, for this one, that, um, where people who had been musicians um, let that give them an arrogance that I think gets in the way of their being the most effective negotiator they can be. And I think a lot of, the higher up you get, the more your, your job is to close deals. Not say no, and the story always is when I'm talking to new people in the business is that um, you know, it's, it's no great power to be able to say no. The power is can you say yes to something? And when you get to that level, you're, you're making hard decisions and, and you don't have a lot of, of objective criteria to make them on. And, and I think if you, you get let that arrogance of, well, I'm a musician, I know better than all these people who are on the creative side because I've been there and I'm a lawyer besides, I think sometimes you don't you don't weigh all the evidence properly, and I've seen some bad decisions made because of that. I, I've probably made some too. I, I just don't know because, um, you know, as much as I, I, one, I don't like to look back, so I don't, I don't second guess myself, and and two, it, it's hard. It, it takes a lot of perspective and time to go back and look at that stuff. So I, I don't. I think it did help me in the sense that I could more credibly evaluate what artists on the roster were telling me or asking for, and I could more credibly uh, evaluate the plausibility of claims that managers were making on behalf of their clients who were musicians 
because I've been on the road and I'd, I'd, I'd known lots of musicians and still do. Um, but uh, apart from that kind of thing, um, I don't think it made me it made me any better a lawyer except in the sense that it made me a better business person that used my legal skills for that purpose. I think that there are lots of other things that also give you that, that, that kind of skill set. Um, I think if you majored in science, you know, um, as an undergrad, for instance, um, or if you did work in the sciences, um, where you also get into a method and, and you're, you're constantly questioning and trying to develop creative ways to, to, to get at the truth of something, I think those skills translate well too. So yeah, I think in that sense it helps, but I don't think anything more than, than something that, 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 that um, puts you in a, a situation where the things you're trying to evaluate and manage are things that you know, aren't um, easily quantifiable, unchanging entities. Um, and yeah, there's no question that as far as the, the, the interpersonal aspect of the law, having been a musician is very helpful because, I mean, you're dealing, again, I, you know, if musicians out there are watching this thing, the reality is that, um, you know, step back, be honest, you know, most of those of us who are musicians have unique personality aspects, that's a tougher way to put it, and you learn to deal with those things, and, and I think that does help you, you know. But scientists are weird too. Four things, I guess. One is, just from a purely observational point of view, um, there have been a lot of people in the music business over the last five or six years who have been trying to go for this kind of thing. Um, I know, um, I just, at Warner, Russ Sider and I were talking about that kind of thing with several other people at the company, and Jeff Quatnitz has been trying to do with the firm, the management company, for quite a while, and EMI tried to make it happen with their Robbie Williams deal, and um, it's, it's an, un so going to the analytic part, it's an understandable response to the fact that um, while for a long time record sales are what drove, you know, the way that people approach the music business at the higher levels. I mean, obviously at, 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 the, at the sort of surviving musician level, um, it, it wasn't that important. There, there are plenty of country artists that haven't sold very many records for years that make an exceedingly good living because they're out on the road and they get fans to come. And Neil Diamond, you know, Neil Diamond hadn't sold a lot of records, you know, in a long time, even with Rick Rubin producing him. But he still gets sold out tours and makes a fortune from him. Um, but for the the upside, the, the, the part of the record business, that's the part that everybody focuses on, including the people that um, are looking at these tiny little parts of conglomerates or the record companies. Yeah, they want to see the big dollars, and records aren't a part of that. So you want to look at those other income streams that, by and large, the record labels have done a great deal to create. I mean, it's very hard to become somebody making a lot of money on the road unless you've had some record company put a lot of money into promoting you and building up your brand so you can cash it in. Although there are plenty of acts that, as I say, play, do fine on the road that have never sold a record and no one's ever heard of them except for the fans that go see them because they're incessantly out on the road. Um, but um, So I understand why it's happening. Do I think the deals make sense? Honestly, I think we're so early in the process that the deals probably won't make sense because what's, what's happening now is that everybody wants to be the first to make those deals with the biggest artists. So when Live Nation goes and talks to Madonna, because they desperately want to be the first to make one of these things happen, they make a deal that probably, when you pencil it out, doesn't quite, it's not the deal they'd ideally want to make. But they'll make that deal because they want to be in that business and they want people to, to remember that Live Nation was the one that did it with Madonna worldwide and made it work. So it's going to take, I think, another year or so before the deals settle down to a place and where you're talking about enough artists and enough companies doing it where the deals will make sense. Um, does it make sense for Madonna? Absolutely. You know, she, she still has Warner Brothers working on all those old records they've got in the catalog, and catalog is where Warner makes a lot of money, and the Rhino people are out there. Once, once she becomes a catalog artist, they work it, and that, that's what they do. That's the, that's the part of the company that's making the most money for them right now, you know, if you look at return on investment. Um, so all those things are good. Um, is the entity that eventually becomes the entity that makes those deals with artists going to be a live nation? That I'm not so sure about. Um, for a long time I thought that the, the likeliest entity to uh, end up being in that position would be a management company. Um, because they're the ones who have to do more of those kinds of things and have expertise in more of those areas and have more hands-on knowledge than a record company does, um, or a booking agent does, or a promoter does, or a promotion company does. Um, I still think that's most likely to be the case. Uh, but 
at the beginning, the artists that this is going to make sense for are, are I, I think, going to be like Madonna, artists who aren't necessarily cutting edge on the recorded music side. And again, if, if anybody who's been around as long as Madonna has been, has a shot at still being cutting edge, it's Madonna. But I think anyone look at the numbers would say that it's an uphill battle for every release now. Um, but it's going to be an artist that's more focused on live stuff to make the money. For that, the company to be the 360 company to do it, to be a, 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 a live performance, a booking age entity, a, a promoter, that makes sense. But when you get to a place where everybody's making those kinds of deals, and everyone's trying. I mean, the, the first draft form that Warner Brothers Records sends out now includes merchandising, and includes um, publishing, and includes, um, you know, the live performance stuff. Um, before that starts to make sense, those companies have to develop internal expertise at doing those things to make it valid, valid for the artist. And I think that the managers and the attorneys out there are aware of that, and they're still working hard to, to not give those rights up unless they get some expertise from the company and or they get a big advance to cover for it, you know, but something so that they're actually getting some value for that. And I think it's still too early to see how it's going to fall out. But it wouldn't surprise me to see one of the, one of the more mid-sized management companies that has some of those mid-sized developing acts, you know, basically advise them, you know, you don't need to go to a major. We'll take you to the next level. Let's stay here. Let's build it organically. Um, and, you know, once a couple of those acts break through, that will become the paradigm. And it, it, I, I'm, I'm thinking we're talking no more than three to five years. Again, I think it depends on the artist. Uh, I think in general that's true I, I, because, um, you know, look, let's look at the charts the last couple of weeks. You know, you had number one records that, in a couple of cases, didn't even sell 100,000 units. Two years ago, a record that sold 77,000 units, which was the number one chart record two weeks ago, would have been somewhere in the, in the low 60s. Okay, so clearly record sales aren't what they used to be. And even if you add back in the... the, the iTunes and, and the Rhapsody and the Amazon.com and the foreign versions of that stuff. Um, while those account for a huge volume, I was talking to somebody at one of the other record companies, uh, not Warner, um, the other day, um, and uh, just asked him in connection with the teaching what, what you know, uh, percentage of the volume that they did um, was related to digital exploitations. And um, I purposely got the question vague to see how he'd respond to it. And he said, a little over 40%. And I said, I assume you're talking about number of units and not dollar income. He said, of course, you know, because and that's what they're doing. They're fighting a public relations battle too. And they and the RA want to go out and say, you know, we have this problem, but we're making movement on the digital front. So they can say it accounts for over 40% of our volume because it probably does because all those downloads from iTunes are singles, they're single tracks. And nobody's selling singles in the physical world. They're selling albums. So of course it's going to be a huge, but it's not comparing apples and apples. Mm -hmm. So look at the dollar amounts, the dollar value, and the number is probably closer to six, five to six percent for the most digitally involved company, and closer to two to three percent for the for the for the bigger companies. Um, so even with that, it doesn't make up for the fact that sales are off. Um, and, and while the touring business has had its problems as well. Um, if you set up a tour properly, and if you get the right mix of artists, you either get a legacy artist and then some opening acts, or you get a group of, of acts, like on a, a warped tour or, or, or something like that, um, you still do very well at that. So while the warped tour guys and while the uh, U2s or the Rolling Stones or the, if Radiohead goes out on the road and takes an opening act with them, they still want acts to be on those tours that have record deals and have records coming out. And that's, you still need that in many cases to get on those tours unless you're managed by somebody the same. Um, it's not because um, there's a sense that, you know, well, we, the act, need to have the record because we need the tour to work the record. It's because the people doing the tour are basically saying to the artist, look, we don't want you on our tour unless you can bring something to the table. And what you can bring if you've got a record out is your company's going to try to promote that record. That'll help promote our tour. You still get that. But, but definitely, the, 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 the dog here is, is the tour. Um, it, it's not, it's, and the tail is, is the record sales, in almost every case, almost every case. Well, first of all, the contract said they were works for hire. Uh, but if you go back and you check out section 101, title 17, you know, back in the day when we were doing it, there was no category for sound recordings. 
And if you look at the contracts, you know, they would have language in there saying it's a work for hire because it's a contribution to a collective work or whatever they'd say. And we don't know whether that's going to fly or not. We're going to find out soon enough because the termination rights are going to start kicking in in 2013. And um, there's going to be a case that's going to make a decision on that. So we don't know. I, honestly, um, I don't know that. I, I don't think it was the intent of the, the draft, the, the people who drafted the 76 Act that um, uh, collective works were supposed to include sound recordings, to tell you the truth. Um, I'm not saying that's a legal judgment here, and I'm not giving anybody out there legal advice, and everybody knows that, just to make sure we're clear on that. But it wouldn't surprise me if that's the conclusion that, that they came down. Uh, on the other hand, it wouldn't surprise me if they decide that you know, the parties who made the deal intended it to be a work for hire. And therefore, don't tell me this, that you were thinking that you'd sneak out later on because, because I don't think that's going to fly. So I, I think it's going to come down to, you know, which court it comes up in, how far it gets appealed, who's on the Supreme Court if it goes that far, and whether the focus is on what the parties who made the deal cared about and what the parties who, um, and what the people who drafted the, the, the copyright law really cared about. Now, why does it matter? It matters for that very reason. I mean, artists want to, you know, they, um, apart from the, 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 the moral issue, to use a, a word that nobody really cares about anymore these days, apparently, um, uh, you know, of, 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 you know, taking as your own the rights to something else that somebody created, which is what work for hire means. It means as far as the copyright law is concerned, put the contract aside, as far as the copyright law is concerned, means that the employer is the creator. And you can put in the contract that you'll get credit and you'll get some share of the income. As far as the copyright law is concerned, the employer is the creator. And I always had a problem with that too. Um, there were plenty of other ways to deal with that, it seemed to me. And, and um, certainly before the 1976 Copyright Act, when there were termination rights, there were easier, much easier ways to deal with it. Um, interestingly enough, I, I've seen that um, it's not anywhere near as uncommon as it used to be um, for even the bigger companies to, for certain kinds of acts, um, uh, who've already put out records on their own, who take a strong position on not you know, giving away ownership in their stuff, that the record companies will let it be a license deal. Um, and I think that's a good thing. Uh, I think it's, it's good for everybody because, the, for one thing, as a practical matter, the number of records that has a lifespan beyond 35 years, which is when the termination right kicks in, is pretty small. And um, even for records that have a lifespan beyond 35 years, um, I, I haven't seen a whole lot of evidence that the companies that control those rights have done such a spectacular job of exploiting those rights for any, in any meaningful way that does anything near what the, copy, what the Constitution says the copyright law is supposed to do, which is balance the, the protections to the creator with dissemination to the public and benefit to the public and progress of the arts. Um, yeah, all you have to do is, is you know, walk, it's better now because of the internet, but all you have to do is walk the streets in Japan and see all the stuff that Atlantic Records put out on, the, on their jazz label and their R&B labels in the 40s and 50s, and it's all in print in Japan. Even in today's world, where, where, where brick and mortar sales are not in the United States, you can't even get it online. All right, so um, I, I think the trend is moving towards, um, you know, hey, we understand that we being the record companies, we understand that you know we're part of a big machine. We want to be a player in all the other parts. And in order to do that, we may have to cut back on on how intense we are about some of these other things that we could get away with before. And there's a transitional uh, thing going on with the people who work at those companies. And in five years, there'll be hardly any people like us who remember the bad old days, and, uh, which were also the good old days. And um, the people who'll be running those companies, to the extent there are any left, there'll probably only be three by then. Um, there'll be people who've come up through the ranks on the artist side, just like we did back in the day. And we changed the way the record business had been run up until the mid-60s, late 60s, and they'll do the same thing. And I think one of the casualties, and it'll be a good thing, uh, no one's going to weep over this, I don't think, maybe a CFO someplace, will be um, those work for hire deals um, where artists have to give up all their rights. Oddly enough, the people that hang the most on that are some of the smaller independent labels. They just got used to getting that, and now they, they, they're not going to back away from it. it it's, a, it's fascinating, the psychology of this stuff. First thing to point out is that um, there haven't been a lot of real good studies about what proportion of the transactions 
on file sharing networks relate to copyrighted material as opposed to the, the transactions that don't. Um, in part because it's hard to get information that you can accurately rely upon. Um, it's pretty safe to say, I think, given from the, the, the way that the entities that have an ox to gore in this battle on the peer-to-peer -peer side, um, side have done it, that, that certainly um, trafficking in copyrighted material is a part of their business plan. They can't admit that because given the, the Grokster decision, if they admit that, then they're going to be an infringer and huge problems. So nobody can admit that, nobody can, because the law basically says now, as near as we can tell, Supreme Court decisions, so who knows, um, that uh, you know, if you market your device or your service uh, in such a way that you're encouraging people to use it or encouraging people as to the function, the potentially infringing function it has, then you'll be liable as, an infring as a contributory infringer. And that's not what the law was before that case. Um, so they can't say that, but I think everybody who's dealt with them knows that that's certainly a part of their business plan. Um, on the other hand, there's plenty of stuff on, on those sites that's not copyrighted. Um, and um, uh, I think it would be a mistake, both intellectually, economically, technologically, and morally, to shut down those sites just because um, you know, there is some infringing use there. It's a wonderful technology that just uh, makes communication so much easier and, and, and allows people to learn more about the world in ways they couldn't do it before. That would be a real problem. Be viol it would be directly contrary to what the point of copyright law is pursuant to the Constitution in this, in, in this country. Um, so what you have to do is approach it in a way that allows you to discriminate between the stuff that's a problem and the stuff that's not. Um, and you know, we have the technology now to do it. There are issues. I mean, we, we, we actually can track because of the headers on those files and we can track wh where stuff goes from, who's downloading what and for how long and using it. And if we really wanted to, and if we had the cojones to do it, we could have all that information handy. And if we wanted, I, if you came to me, if I was running a record company, you came to me and said, look, the way we're going to do this thing is we're going to be able to track every time somebody streams your master recording. And we're going to be able to track every time it gets offloaded to a third-party device. And we're going to be able to track how many times it's played back on that third-party device. And we will give you a tenth of a penny for each of those things. I'd do that in a second because I'd make a four, much more than I'm making from selling a CD once and then I don't get any more money from that afterwards. And I think everybody in the business knows that, but no one's come to them with that proposal. And part of the reason why they have it is because even though that technology exists, there are all kinds of privacy issues and, and other issues that are, are really problematic. Now, they're problematic for me. They might be problematic for you. I'm not sure they're problematic for everybody. I mean, I, every time I open the newspaper, I read, just today there's a story about how the, the German government wants to um, put Trojan um, uh, programs onto people's computers so that they can track what, pe what sites people are going to, what the keystrokes are on computers. And, you know, there's a certain outcry against that in Germany. Most Germans don't seem to care. And most American commentary says, what's the big deal? We're already doing this kind of thing. And I, I don't see big hue and cry there. So maybe people don't care about that. I, again, it bothers me. And it, it bothers people I talk to. But you know, I, when, you know, when I was in college, you know, I was wandering around in Cambridge you know, in 1972, and we all thought our government was going to win because everybody we talked to you know, was going to vote for it. The guy got crushed. The okay, only state he cared was Massachusetts. That happened to be where we were. So perspective is everything in that. Um, so yeah, technologically, we, we could do that. And I think, I think whatever the result ends up being has to be a result that's premised on that assumption. Um, because if you go with the, the brute force, brick wall approach, all that does is encourage all those smart kids out there to develop technology that gets past the brick wall. So yeah, if all we'd done was try to stop peer to peer, that would have been wonderful. Except that now we've got torrents out there. And now the big battle is what the movie companies want to do. And uh, torrents will do movies, and the peer-to-peers wouldn't without the torrents. And so now we put brick walls up for that, and then someone's developed a better technology. Um, and I think you know, the, 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 the finger in the dike thing is not going to fly. I think we actually have to look at what the consumer wants. And what the consumer wants is exactly what the consumer wanted and accepted when CDs came along. They want convenience, sound quality, picture quality. That's not necessarily what they care about. They want convenience. They want accessibility. And they want it in a format that allows them to have some reliable sense that they'll get what they want to get. I honestly believe if you do that, people will be happy to pay for it. They're not going to pay 99 cents for a track, I don't think. 
you know, because honestly, I think that, you know, that even though it's worked for iTunes so far, yeah, you know, I think the, the right price is probably somewhere between 25 and 50 cents. But that's, that's, that's not, again, massive studies and surveys. It's gut, you know, and maybe make 99 cents work for a while. Um, but it's, you can find a price point where people will go for it um, as long as there aren't a lot of restrictions on what they can do for it. Uh, because I, I, I really believe that even though the big despairing cry now is, oh, the new youth, they don't care about property rights. You know, if you ask them, is downloading okay? They say, well, you know, if God had invented the, you know, had, had, hadn't invented the Internet, then that'd be fine. But he did, so I guess it's okay to copy or it's some variation on that. And, but by the same token, um, those are the kids that um, if, you know, their experience is, um, uh, you know, they don't have the experience that we had where we, when we bought a CD, we could make copies if we want. We could play it in the car. We could play it you know, um, at home. We could play it at multiple homes. We could take it on a vacation and play it on the airplane and stuff. And they don't have that experience. If they grow up believing that, hey, even if I buy it from iTunes, I can only offload it to three devices. Or if something happens to my iPod, I got to buy the track again. Wow, that's not so bad if I'm, a, if I'm an evil record company. Because now these people don't, no longer expect that they'll be able to own something. They'll, they, they'll accept the fact that it's a license. That seems to me is a much bigger transition than this other thing. Because you're always going to find a, point, a price point where people will pay it if there's some convenience and some reliability attached. But if you can get people to, to get past the, I own it, and now it's, I, it's a license, and there are restrictions on what I can do for it, that's power. That's money. And I think that's going to be the big change. And I think we're already seeing it start to happen. I, I think that if we're looking for the most efficient resolution of the problem, um, it may very well be that letting the players, and I'm not saying the market necessarily, because this is a world where the market doesn't necessarily work very well, um, letting them work it out may be a more efficient way to get this resolved than trying to go through the sausage mill of, of getting the copyright law in there. I mean, I can remember, and I, 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 don't, I, don't, I didn't enjoy this, I didn't want to do it at the time, but you know, you work at a company, you have an obligation, business affairs, you have an obligation. I remember going to Congress in 1992 to lobby for the 1993 uh, act, which was a response to DAT, and it was that they basically killed DAT as a commercial medium and put the SDMI um, and all that stuff going. And I can remember walking around, talking to you know, Congress people, and um, they were quite properly skeptical, and um, they were basically saying, look, you're asking me to impose a tax on my constituents. They're getting this stuff for free, now you're asking to pay for it. They get a higher price, and they got to you know, pay more for the tapes and all this kind of stuff. Why should I do that? Is it gonna, if I don't do it, is it going to be less music? Is the music not going to be as good? Is it going to be less accessible? And of course, none of those things was going to happen. And you let something go like that, the legislative process, and you get weird, bizarre results. You get legislation, but it has no practical effect. That, that legislation has had little to no practical effect because no hardware companies put the flags in to, to deal because they all went to, all of a sudden every machine was heavy duty professional because the law didn't apply to professional stuff because that's how the lobbying process worked. So I'm not sure that, 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 that going to the copyright law before you've seen how things shake out in the real world is the right way to go. I think after you've seen how things shake out, what technology does, and you see where things have, have leveled off and, and what accommodations have been worked out, then maybe you modify the copyright law to deal with that. And again, look, look what happened when the Register of Copyrights in, in 2005 you know, comes out and says, you know, the rates are running out, we've got to get some new rates in place, and here's our proposal. And essentially she proposed what goes on in the rest of the world besides the United States and Canada. We'll have you know, a unitary mandatory system, it won't be per unit, it'll be a percentage of PPD, we'll divide that amongst all the users. Everybody said, what are you talking about? They went crazy. You know, it's, it's like, and, and that process has now not just come to a slow grinding, it's like it's hardly moving. It's not a halt yet, but it's pretty close. And that's what happened. I think you have to let the, the, the marketplace, and again, not the market in the economic sense, but let the players who are working, work out something that works for them, see where they go, and that's the only, because reality, once you, you're not going to get Congress to do anything unless you can say, this is what all the players have agreed is the way it's supposed to, because no one wants to go out on that limb. Ah, yes, I love that. I always love when I'm teaching my class and, and we start talking about sampling. And there's always a piano, it's not very good for sampling, but for copyright stuff, it's good that we start doing the sampling thing, and it's a good way to talk about um, 
you know, sampling as opposed to replays, but everybody. I mean, for all the articles that have been written in all the guitar player magazines, like trying, there's still that thing, four bars is okay. I mean, it's, I keep asking, I say, so suppose we did blah, blah, blah. In every, every semester, some kid will say, well, four bars is okay, right? No, wrong. It might be okay, depending on what four bars it is, but, but if it's a sample, and if you're in the Sixth Circuit, nothing's okay, okay? Um, so sampling, basically, as opposed to replaying something, is, as everybody out there probably knows by now, but maybe not, is that you actually incorporate in your own recording um, a recording that somebody else made. Now, typically, in today's world, it's a digital incorporation, but it doesn't have to be. Um, and um, if you take somebody's recording, um, you, somebody, at least since 1972 in the United States, owns the sound recording. And if the performance that's performed in the sound recording is of a composition that's not in the public domain, somebody owns the rights in the composition. So technically, you got to get rights from both those people if you're going to do that. And um, back in the really glory days, of, back, back when it was go-go in D.C. and, and um, you know, sampling was you know, something that only a few people had heard about, very much in the underground. People just put their stuff on the records and didn't worry about it, didn't care at all. And in fact, when those acts started getting signed to labels, I can remember having conversations with, with some of these, these artists. They said, oh man, it's not a problem, dude. That, I just sampled you know, you know, uh, you know, DJ Jive Man, and, and uh, he's a good buddy, and he said it's okay. And it's like, isn't DJ Jive Man signed to Universal? Yeah, well, what, so what? No, no, Universal owns that, not DJ Jive, man. You, you got to go, who owns the sound recording copyright? You got to worry about the publishing stuff. So people still didn't care because it was all about street cred. You had to have the samples. And even though you could replay it and you could add, you know, fake, um, you know, surface noise on it and you could do all kinds of things to make it sound like it was sampled, you had to have, had to have the street cred. Then people started getting their royalty statements and they discovered that, um, uh, on some of those records, you know, not only were they losing on the mechanical side, that is the payments for the compositions, if they wrote, they thought they wrote the song, but they'd sample from three or four different people, not only were they not getting any mechanical, they were paying out of their pocket because they were essentially paying for four copyrights on the thing. Um, and they looked at the record royalties and they made the mistake of sampling Prince or they sampled some Motown stuff and they were, or they sampled Sting or the police actually in that particular case and, and they end up giving away their record royalties besides. Um, I find a whole lot of artists now are um, into the replay mode and um, then running it through, you know, Groovalizer or Groovalicious, whichever software they use to get it to sound like it's a sample, uh, because it was becoming an economic problem for them. And for a while there, those were the only people that were actually selling records in the music business, so it actually mattered for them. Um, the whole idea, though, I think uh, that's interesting now, that's sort of the next step along from that is mashups. This whole idea of, you know, we're going to take a couple different recordings or three or four different recordings or recording in a movie and we're going to digitally impose them on each, superimpose them on each other and make something new that incorporates both those things. Which is the kind of thing that has been done in real time for a long time. I mean, I don't know if, you know, if you may remember doing this because we're of that age, but, you know, there were people who would put the Wizard of Oz on and then they would put on, you know, Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon, and if you started them at the right time, and if you were under the influence, so it's said, of, of the right substances, you could actually see an amazing coherence of, of changes in the music and changes in that. And if you're doing it in real time, or as the, the music supervisors like to say, dropping the needle, you can do that. It's not a problem. You know, performance, and if you're in a venue to the public, then you know, performance license will cover that because you're not really synchronizing, you're just dropping the needle. But you start making recordings of that stuff, and now you're synchronizing, now you're putting stuff together, now you're making a derivative work out of it, and now you got to deal with um, having to get licenses. And the people who do it on the audio side, they're used to the idea that, hey, if I use a song, I can get compulsory licenses. Forget that compulsory licenses don't work if you change the character of the composition you're using. So if you sample it and put it into another song, you change the character. If you do a mashup, you change the character. If you do a medley, you change the character. Um, and so they're thinking, big deal, I'll deal with it after the fact. Except after the fact means that the person who owns the rights can say, no, you can't do it at all. Or worse yet, yeah, you can do it $10 billion up front against a $5 per unit royalty. And um, I've actually seen holdups like that. And you know, that's why every once in a while, you know, when you go buy, you know, an addition to that record, 
you know, or a, a, a few months or maybe even a year after it's come out the first time, there'll be different songs on the record because it's, you just can't economically keep that track on there. Um, and again, I, I have noticed that, that people are more aware of the fact that there are issues raised by sampling. And the problem isn't that they're not aware of the issues. The problem is the information out there has not kept the quality information, not kept up with the interest. So that even though people know that there's a problem, they still think that four bars is okay. And they still think that as long as the guy who did the record told me it was okay, it's fine. And that's a problem. And, and that's, again, you know, it's, it's people, the sources to find out this information, they're everywhere. You don't have to go to a music industry program. Not that they shouldn't go to those programs, because they're great, but, you know, even if you can't afford it, or even if you're older than that, you don't want to go back and hang around with people with tattoos and piercings. Um, you can still find this stuff out, because there's, every magazine out there has somebody writing about, you know, the legal aspects of, you know, guitar playing, keyboard playing, music, electronic music, whatever it is. And by and large, most of those people, whatever their qualities as transactional attorneys may be, and I've dealt with some of them, haven't dealt with other ones, the articles they write, there aren't a whole lot of egregious factual errors. And um, there's no reason to not know that stuff. And if you're at a level where you got a manager, and God forbid an attorney, then there's a huge problem. The, the, the fact that people continue to make those mistakes remains astonishing to me. Um, it, 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 it's either just a sort of, you know, I don't care attitude, or it's um, just, you know, total recklessness. Maybe a little bit of both. First thing I'd say is, um, if you're gonna be a musician, if you think you wanna be a musician, um, look inside your gut and make sure you really love playing music. Because if you don't, if you're doing it just to, you know, deal with sharks at the, at the Chateau Marmot and, and, and relive the Led Zeppelin, or to find girls, it's not going it's, it's to work. You have to really care about music. And you have to be good at it. Um, second thing is, make sure that, unless you just want to be a composer, um, that you know how to entertain people. That you know how to, you know, when you go out and do a show, that people go away feeling like they want to see it again. It doesn't have to be that you're, you know, life of the party kind of thing. You can be, you know, morose and gloomy, and as long as people feel transformed by your moroseness and gloominess and want to come and see you again, because that's how the business works. And music, historically, has always been a social thing. And it's always been a thing where people come together and part of the experience is that. And we've lived through this weird interregnum, maybe 100 years, um, where you could make a lot of money from music without having to go from place to place and perform it. But historically, that was never the case. You know, it wasn't until you know, Paganini and Liszt, you know, really in, in the latter part of the 19th century where you could even make a lot of money and become a superstar from performing. I mean, you know, guys like Bach and Haydn, the reason that they wrote all that stuff is because they had to. And they had to have a lot of jobs because there just wasn't money in it. Um, but now we're going back to a place where the likelihood of being able to make large sums of money unrelated or to only tangentially related to your performing abilities, I think that age is going away. So make sure that you can connect in a visceral way with an audience, make them want to come back. So do you need a record label? Depends on what you want to do. If the kind of music you want to make doesn't require triple scale guys or orchestras or large funding to get people together and record in the facilities that require large amounts of funding, no, you don't need a major label. If you don't want to be an international multimedia megastar, and what you really want to do is be able to make a living from music, no, you probably don't need a major label. Um, but depending on what you want to do, you might. If you want to become the next Madonna, at some point you are going to need a major label to take you from whatever level of success you are to that international kind of success. That could change. I doubt if it will. Because the risk factor and the investment that you have to put into making that happen is pretty much beyond the realm of doing it yourself. And banks are never, bankers are conservative people. They're never gonna get in the place of going out big money for someone because they're gonna become the next Madonna. It's just not gonna happen. Um, so you have to look at what you wanna do. Do you need a manager? I always tell, I tell my clients, uh, I told my clients, I tell the people I consult with now, and I tell my students, um, managers can be great. But too many people fall into the trap of feeling like getting a manager is really just the next validation of my professional progress. And hey, I'm successful. You, know, you go to your significant other, you go to Uncle Fred, you go to your parents. We're moving along, man. We just got a manager. No. 
only reason to get a manager is if there's something that that manager can do for you that you can't do for yourself better than a manager can. Or you're just so tired of doing it that you want someone else to do it for you. And if there isn't something that makes sense to do that, they can't do better or cheaper, that you don't need a manager. And you shouldn't have one. Now, having a second set of ears or a second set of brains to look at a situation, give you advice, that's priceless. But because it's priceless, you don't have to pay 15 or 20 percent to get that. Unless you are one of those artists, and there are artists like this, obviously, who is totally cut off from interaction with normal society um, and has no friends or no friends they can trust or only hangers on and gravy trainers. Um, you got people you can get objective advice from. They may not know the business that well, but you know what? There are a lot of managers out there that don't know the business that well either. And again, you have to look at what they can do for you that you can't do for yourself. And I think you need to be careful to evaluate every decision you make in terms of, okay, what am I trying to do? What am I trying to accomplish? Do I want to make billions of dollars and have groupies and everything else? Or do I want to make music that people will hear? Or do I want to be able to preserve my music so it'll be around forever? Or do I want to make a living doing music because that's what I like doing? And depending on what, then you have to, what your choice is, then you look at how, what you need. Do you need somebody to help you because you're going to be on the road all the time to handle the business part of that because you hate it and you can't do it because you're on the road. Um, if people like the music you record and they come to your website, are you really going to want to spend half your day getting those details, stuffing envelopes full of, of, of CDs and taking them down to the post office? That's probably not what your vision of being in the music business was, although that's what most people in the music business do, oddly enough, metaphorically or otherwise. Um, and you have to look at your career that way. You have to look at it from, from an outcome-focused point of view. What are you trying to get out of it? Um, and, um, and if you feel like you need someone to help you or you want someone to help you, then can that person really help you? What are you trying to have them help you with? You know, do you want, is what you want them to do is to get you a gig with, you know, at the right kind of club, get you on the right tour, or do you want them to get you a record deal? Well, then that's going to condition who you go with. And it may be that nobody can do that or the price they're asking is too much. Always a cost-benefit analysis. And just because you want to be a musician doesn't mean that you, can't, you, you, you can ignore the business side of it. Even if you've got a business manager and a manager and an attorney and other advisors and hangers on, doesn't mean that you can afford to ignore that part of it. It's your life. You will always care more about it than they will. You've got to ask them questions. You've got to know enough about what's going on to be able to ask them good questions. And you know what? If they can't explain to you in a way you can understand why they're doing what they're doing and what your situation is, you got the wrong people. Because the, the, the key requirement is that you can understand what they're telling you and, and they can explain to you what's going on with your life and your career. And most mistakes that have happened that I've seen in, in 25, 30 years have been because people didn't understand what was really going on with their careers because they had people that were the big names but not necessarily people that could work with them. All right, I've taken way too long. Makes perfect sense. No, it doesn't, but because it, there's no sense in anything. But. <laughs> Thank you for talking to us, nevertheless. I, yeah, I try. <laughs> no, it's all fun. <laughs>